go to the beach today We'll go dive and swim in the waves All thanks to MPA It's safe for you and me And for the fish swimming in the sea Now they live happily All thanks to MPA Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can everybody see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Well, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. And thank you for joining us as we celebrate South Africa's second Marine Protected Areas Day. When we launched MPA Day last year, we had no idea that it would grow the way it has. And we look forward to it becoming a global celebration in the next few years. But the reason Marine Protected Areas Day has grown is because of the passion and enthusiasm of the team that make MPA Day possible. And I'd like to start here with a huge thank you to all of you who've worked so hard behind the scenes to make MPA Day a reality. So thank you so much to all of you for your commitment. MPA Day would not exist without you. My second thank you goes to all of you, our audience. We've got over 100 people joining us here today from all over the world. Sorry, guys, not to put a bit of fear into you, but we have we have people from around the world joining us today. And thank you so much for, for joining us for what should be a very interesting webinar. And then my last thank you is a big thank you to Flo for hosting us and for handling all of the technical side of this webinar. Thank you very much to Flo Communications. Now, last year for MPA Day, we had a very ambitious webinar where we crossed live to various MPAs where people were doing all sorts of exciting things. This year, we decided we'd do something slightly different for our MPA Day webinar. And today we have four incredible scientists joining us. All of them have dedicated their lives to studying the animals and particularly the fish in marine protected areas. And they're going to help us answer questions about the effectiveness of marine protected areas using different research methods. So I think that that's enough from me. I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, who is Professor Colin Atwood, and he's from the University of Cape Town. Colin, over to you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we use survey data in, uh, from marine protected areas to, to help with the management of those areas. But in fact, for me, I'm more interested in how we can use that information for fisheries management itself and, and to try to improve uh, fishing and, and, and fish management broadly across the country. To do that, I'm going to go into a little bit of history to, to try to explain how how the different types of data have been used in South Africa. And um, if you don't mind, I'm almost immediately going to share screen because I have a bit of a PowerPoint presentation. There we go. Um, Judy, can you see that? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's just the front page. So I'll get off that quite quickly. In the late 1980s, there was something of a realization that across the globe, fish, and for that matter, fishing, was in a bit of trouble. There were many examples, mostly from the northern hemisphere, of fish stock collapses. It became abundantly clear that the rate at which we catch fish can outstrip the capacity of fish to replenish their, their populations. Not only was this causing massive economic and social problems, uh, but the conservationists were getting upset too, as there was fear that ecosystems could be negatively affected and that some fish species could quite easily go extinct. It was apparent that the fishery managers possibly got things wrong. Maybe their, their methods um, that they used to monitor fish catches weren't so good or, or fish abundance or Perhaps their ability to control the fishes was inadequate. And a lot of people thought that a new approach might be needed. One option that the conservationists were pushing was the idea of marine protected areas. They effectively borrowed this idea from, from the terrestrial experience 
uh, where there were reserves to, to protect land animals. But let me tell you, among the marine scientists, there was a huge amount of skepticism. I mean, for one, fish can move vast distances. Their eggs can drift over vast distances. And there's no way we can fence a marine protected area like we fence Kruger National Park, for example. So the effectiveness of marine protected areas had to be proved. Nobody believed it would just work like that. But one immediate problem was that the, the moment you, you take fishermen out of a marine protected area, you effectively lose your data as well because fishery scientists are usually very heavily dependent on sampling fish that, that the fishermen catch. So one, once the fishermen got out of an area, now, now we had no way of getting data. We, we couldn't actually see if the fish were going to increase or, or not. So the fishery scientists had to sample the fish themselves. And this proved to be inefficient and quite expensive. We never got nearly the sort of sample sizes that, that we could get um, when the fishermen were there. But this is how surveys in marine protected areas began. And we started generating data. We needed to, to find out how the fish responded when fishing stopped in an area. South Africa played quite an important role in these early days in establishing the idea that we could positively influence fish abundance by excluding fishermen from, from certain areas. And the first to do so was Dr. Colin Buxton from Rhodes University, who pre presented evidence from the Cape South Coast that the fish were larger inside the Tsitsikama Marine Protected Area, that's the green arrow showing where that is, uh, when compared to fish caught at Mossel Bay and uh, for that matter at Port Elizabeth. Uh, he, he did his study on, on Roman, the fish on the left and Dagarat on the right, and showed that the, the Roman were between one and four centimeters larger in, in Tsitsikama than in the other areas, and that the Dagarat were eight to nine centimeters larger. Now, now, a couple of centimeters doesn't sound like much, but these fish are slow growing, and it takes them a long time to, to make up that kind of length. But more importantly, uh, the fecundity of fish, in other words, the amount of eggs that they can produce goes up exponentially with their length. So Buxton deduced that the fish in the marine protected area were living for longer and produced far more eggs than those outside. But there was a criticism that the skeptics were still there and one criticism about these findings is that we cannot be sure that the difference be, we see between protected areas and fished areas cannot be attributed to reasons other than protection. For example, it could simply be that the habitat in Tsitsikama was better and, and it protect, you know, the bigger fish preferred living there. So there was some skepticism when these spatial comparisons you know, were done. Well, we managed to get around this in two different ways. And, and the first of these was to do many, many surveys. In fact, since, since uh, Colin Buxton's work, uh, we've looked at Roman at Gokama, we've looked at White Stumpnose at Langabon, Holyun on the Cape Peninsula, Surf Zone Fish at Cape Vidal, Reef Fish in Ponderland. We've done many of these comparisons around the country and, and practically every case and every species we find more and bigger fish in the protected area than outside. So now, of course, it becomes much more difficult for the skeptics to say, well, oh, that's just because the habitat's better inside. It, you know, that wouldn't be the case if, if it turns out wherever you go that the protected area holds more. So that helped quite a bit in convincing people that protected areas do work. But then a golden opportunity came when the state decided that uh, it was going to nationalize large parts of the coast at De Hoop. And in fact, 60 kilometers of, of privately owned coastline was, was um, expropriated from private owners and a big protected area on land and in the sea was created. This happened in September 1985 when the fishermen were kicked out. 
But fortunately, a scientist at the University of Cape Town, who I had the pleasure of working with, uh, Dr. Bruce Bennett, started monitoring the fish catches before the reserve was closed and then continued to do so for many, many years afterwards. And the results, the results that we came up with were uh, published in the early 1990s. And I'll just show you some of these quickly. Each of these panels refers to a different fish. And each of the, the four bars refers to a different time period. And the first of these is before the marine protected area was created. And the other three are one year apart after it was created. And it shows in the case of Holyun how quickly the numbers of fish jumped up after the reserve was created. And blacktail on the right shows the same thing. The white steenbrass took a little bit longer to recover, but as you can see, there's no doubt it was going up. And the same thing happened with zebra. And the same thing happened with the Cape stump nose. And the white mussel cracker, which wasn't even present in the beginning, suddenly appeared out of nowhere and their numbers increased too. We never got many bronze bream, but most of them happened quite a while after the protected area was created. And the one fish which didn't seem to respond at all uh, was the bellman. So the majority of the fish showed uh, recoveries. So now there could be no argument about differences in habitat. And here was the first evidence that fish can recover following the establishment of, of a reserve. And by now we knew that most fish we want to protect are resident, or at least they make repeated use of the same area. So, so the critics that said they, they move around and, and you need a fence, uh, that argument uh, fell away. In the years that followed, we carried on monitoring the fish at De Hoop. Whereas the initial objective of the research was accomplished, we now wish to know how the abundance of fish progresses over the long term without the effect of fishing. In other words, we're looking at the scale of natural variation. This helps us to better understand the dynamics of fish populations. In the case of Holyun, the graph on the left, what that shows is that, yes, the numbers increased for the first 10 or 15 years, but then they came down again, almost as low as they were in the beginning, and then steadily went up again. And what we've learned from this is that the fish recovered so quickly and so fast that they actually overshot the mark. And there were so many of them that they, they ate up the resources. And then the population crashed again. It went through a long cycle and slowly it's come back. And right now at, at 2020, it's probably at the right kind of level. So it's much more stable now than, than it used to be. And this goes some way to show just how disturbing fishing can be uh, for an ecosystem. On the right is the same curve, but this time for the spotted gully shark. And you can see there's been a, a much slower and steadier increase um, of the spotted gully shark. But research into the effects of protected areas on fish goes way beyond just tracking their numbers and size. Sometimes we also look for the ecological impacts of fishing. And sometimes we need to stop fishing to try to understand what it does to the ecosystem. The one really interesting set of results was presented by a team of scientists led by Dr. Albrecht Gutz from the Rhodes University. They studied Roman once again. Uh, you, you'll know that these fish change sex from, from female to male. So we were interested in the effect of protection on the age at which they're going to change their sex. They compared Roman inside the marine protected area to those a mile away on the outside. The habitat was pretty much identical. And what they found was, as before, the Roman inside, the, this is the green box, shows higher counts than outside. So there were more fish inside the protected area than outside. And, and this was shown before. So there was no surprise here. And we also found that the fish were longer, bigger inside the protected area than outside, as we discovered before. 
But when we looked at the sex change, we found that it took them an extra two years to change sex inside the marine protected area than outside. And, and bear in mind, these, these groups of fish were about a mile apart, which shows you just how localized the effects of fishing can be. Those fish outside had to change sex earlier because all the male fish were being taken out. And the females had to change sex at an earlier age by up to two years, as you can see, to try to balance the sex ratio. So that, that, that was a result that showed how the physiology of fish can actually be affected by fishing. And then came a really interesting result which showed that crinoids, which are, are, are brittle stars, the numbers of crinoids inside the marine protected area was negatively affected. In other words, there were so many Roman that they ate up the crinoids. And outside the marine protected area there were lots more crinoids. And anyone who's dived in False Bay will know what I'm talking about. There are loads and loads of brittle stars. And the reason for that is that we've taken out the Roman and we've taken out the red stump nose and there's nothing to eat these things anymore. And then they looked at how fat the Roman were. And here we, you get a result that you might think is counterintuitive, but it's not really. The fish inside the marine protected area were thinner than the ones outside. And, and, and the reason for that is the ones outside had so much to eat because there were so few of them, there was very little competition. So all of this monitoring of the numbers inside and outside the protected areas has taught us a huge amount about how fish respond to fishing. But the final and most serious doubt cast over the effectiveness of marine protected areas concerns the effects of what's called fishing displacement. So what we mean by this is when you create a marine protected area, you might not necessarily be solving a problem. You might simply be moving the problem from one place to another. And this was a serious challenge. If the problem is indeed too many fishermen, then a marine protected area might simply push the fishermen from one place to another place. And while things are improved in the marine protected area, you might find it gets worse outside. So in the worst scenario, we might gain nothing at all. We might increase fish in the reserve, but then outside, fish get proportionately less. So we gain nothing. So to find out if this was true, a team led by Professor Karvat uh, from the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment examined the Roman catches at Gokama inside the protected area and outside the protected areas, as the panel below shows. But then he also got data from all around the country to find out what was happening with Roman. And in fact, he showed that the catches of Roman increased after the protected area was created. So the, the green arrow up top shows the trend at Gokama after 1990 when it was implemented. And it shows that the catches actually went up outside the protected area. Very important, he showed also that in other parts of the country, the catches of Roman went down or stayed the same. So the logic of this was that the fish must have increased in number in the protected area, and we knew it did. We knew the eggs and the larvae were moving out of the protected area, and in fact, it increased the numbers of fish outside. It did not decrease them, as the critics suggested it might have done. So overall, the fishermen benefited from the closure, the small closure from fishing at Gokama, where there's now a huge number of, of Roman and other species. And the, the fishermen have benefited from that. that. That paper was published and very well received all around the world. And, and frankly, it's, it's one of a handful of papers that has managed to show without any doubt that fishing benefited directly from the creation of a marine protected areas. So I'll finish off by saying that surveys of fish in protected areas continue throughout the country and give us vital information for the management of protected areas and perhaps more importantly, for the management of the fish and, and the fisheries themselves. Julie, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Colin. I think that you have very eloquently answered the question, do MPAs work? 
So hopefully that has set the scene for the rest of our presentations. And thank you very much for doing that so clearly for us. We will now move on to our next presenter. So what we're going to do is we're going to do all four presentations and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end just for a few questions. So we'll go on to our next presenter who is Dr. Bruce Mann. He is from the Oceanographic Research Institute, which is part of the South African Association for Marine Biological Research in Durban. Hey, Bruce, over to you. Thanks very much, Judy, and good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Lovely to be able to have this opportunity to chat to you all about some of the exciting research that we've been doing. And uh, yeah, thanks, Colin, for a great presentation, which has kind of set the scene for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, which is really how we've used fish tagging um, in, in our MPA research around the South African coast. <clears throat> but just to start, on, start off, what is a fish tag? Really, what we're talking about here um, is a little plastic dart tag we call, sometimes we call it a spaghetti tag, which is inserted into a little um, applicator on the left there, and that gets used to insert into the dorsal musculature of, of a fish. So it's a very simple process um, that we use. And this is how we really go through that process. First of all is the catching the fish, which is the exciting and the fun part that we all enjoy. Um, we, When we're doing this research, we put great emphasis on the handling and the care of the fish. We keep them in the water as much as possible. And then for the actual tagging, it's put onto a, onto a soft stretcher um, a cloth, a wet cloth over its eyes to protect it from the sun and calm it down. And the tag is then inserted, you can see there just below the dorsal, dorsal fin, we remove a scale first, and this tag barb locks behind one of the pterygio force, those little bones in the, in the <clears throat> between the neural spines. Then the fish is, is carefully measured, and you can see bottom left there, measuring the fish uh, to either fork or total length, and then quickly released. And that's all it takes. Basically, you're putting a number plate on, on that fish so that you can get some information on it. So what can we learn about from tagging a fish? And you'll see in the picture on the right, there's a recapture. It's a speckled snapper that's been recaught some years later. And you'll see that there's the tag, but it's got a little bit of growth on it, a bit of biofouling, bio we call, call it. <clears throat> but essentially, they're just some basic things that we can learn from this is how long has it been free? So how many days has it been swimming since it was tagged? How far has it moved from where it was tagged? How much has it grown? Hopefully it was measured well when it was tagged and we measure it well again when it was recaptured. And then you could get some more information such as the mortality rates and other, other interesting information on the population dynamics. But I'm going to stick to the, the sort of top two, three points um, in this presentation. So that brings me to the, um, the start of the, the ORI, or Oceanographic Research Institute Cooperative Fish Tagging Project, uh, which started in 1984 and was really the, the, the brainchild of, of Rudy van der Elst, which he's shown in, in the left um, picture there. And um, I've just shown you some pictures of the, the, the various tagging officers. Eleanor Bullen was our tagging officer from 1984 through to about 2009. And Stuart Dunlop took it for another nine years. And our current tagging officer in the bottom right there is Gareth Jordan, who started in about 2018. So this is a wonderful project that is a citizen science project involving members of the public. And just to show you some of the statistics, the project's been running now for 37 years, um, since 1984. We've had 6,800 members join since then. Over 360,000 fish have been tagged. 374 different marine species have been tagged in this program. Um, very importantly, 22,500 fish have been recaptured. So that's a recapture percentage of 6.2%, which is, is better than many other similar programs around the world. Um, and I think recently we had a publication which suggested that the tagging project is one of the longest running and most successful citizen science projects of its kind in Africa. So why am I telling you about this? Well, 
Basically, the re relevance to MPA is, is that several scientific tagging projects have been conducted in different marine protected areas along the South African coast using this ORI tagging project. Um, so that's what I'm going to sort of focus the rest of the presentation on. Colin, in his presentation, alluded to the DeWoop MPA project. Uh, this started in, in 1985 with Bruce Bennett, as he said, and Colin took that over. And now it's very capably run by Lisa Swart and her team from DEFI. Um, that project has tagged over 60,000 fish, quite incredible. And, and they've recaptured over 4,500 fish at a, a recapture percentage of 7%. So this is sort of the flagship project of, of really um, how to use citizen science in, in strictly, strictly uh, controlled um, scientific research projects. Titsikama was probably the next one, and certainly Colin Buxton, as um, Colin mentioned, uh, started some of the offshore tagging on Roman, but um, in the late, um, sorry, in, in sort of 1993, 94, uh, Dr. Paul Cowley and um, later War uh, Professor Warren Potts and their teams took over a, a shore tagging project. Um, and that ran for sure, just under 20 years, I think. They tagged over 11,000 fish, of which 560 were, were recaptured. So more fascinating information from a project conducted in Titsikama from the shore. And this was just a small area that they were focusing in, about four kilometers. Um, another one that, that has started more recently was uh, spearheaded by... Dr. Jan Fenter and Jan Grief and now taken over by, by Karen Bullock from the Eastern Cape Parks and Tourism Agency. Um, because it's, it's a smaller project with a smaller team, they've tagged less fish, but um, still quite big numbers already, 4,300 fish tagged and 143 recaptures. Um, that brings us now into sort of the uh, northern Transkei. Um, I've been running a project in the Ponderland MPA since 2006. This is a boat-based project, um, whereas the other ones I was showing you were shore-based. Um, here we're focusing on reef fish species, and yeah, it's it's been quite incredible doing this monitoring program, but we've tagged over 5,000 fish, and look at that recapture rate, 1,285 recaptured, a 26% recapture rate. Many of, many of these are, are multiple recaptures uh, with fish like yellow bellies and, and um, punskop or black bustle cracker. We catch them again and again, the same fish. Some of them we even give names. <clears throat> and the last one I just wanted to mention is up in the Isamangaliso MPA in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Um, again, this is um, led by myself and, and a team of guys. Initially, it was Mike Tilsley from KZN Wildlife and then Stuart Dunlop and um, more recently Rob Kyle from Ushaka Marine World have assisted me, me with this. And we have a whole team. All these projects have whole teams of anglers that, that go with on them and fish in specified areas, looking at often catches inside marine protected areas where no fishing allowed, is allowed and comparing them to adjacent fish areas. Um, so this project, again, over 10,000 fish tagged and over 1,300 recaptured. So huge amounts of data, projects that are being carried on for a really long time. And I think, um, as I've alluded to, it's one of the really important elements of all these research projects are that they've been carried out as citizen science projects. So they involve members of the angling public. And it's really an incredible um, experience for these anglers to, at you know, firsthand experience the size and the abundance of fish that Colin was talking about in our MPAs. And I think many of them have gone on to become real ambassadors for the, the continued existence of our, our MPAs, because quite honestly, seeing is believing um, when you have such an incredible experience. So then just to focus on what have these long-term tagging projects really taught us? And again, Colin has alluded to some of these, um, and, and I can add a few more pearls of, of wisdom that we've gained through these, these projects. And the first one is that many of our reef fish species are really resident. Um, and as Colin mentioned, 
the abundance, so the numbers of them and their size is much, much bigger inside no-take MPA. So where no fishing is, is allowed, the fish increase in number and they increase in size over time. Um, from the tagging, we've, we've learned from recapturing fish that many of the these species and many of the ones that I'm showing in, in the diagrams on the right have uh, very, very small home range sizes. So a couple of hundred meters um, is, is the area that they live in there and they can remain in those areas for years and years, which highlights their, their vulnerability because if you go and fish on those reefs and catch out those fish, um, it, it takes while, a while to, for them to recover. So small home ranges and highly resident. Some fascinating work that we've learned about is, is a chalun, um, which is our national fish. And a lot of the work of this was done um, by Colin and his team in, in De Hoop and along the, the Cape Peninsula, which is now part of the Table Mountain MPA. And what they found through their, their tag recapture was that the majority of fish were highly resident. 95% of the chalun stayed in the same place and that many of them were caught repetitively in the same places. But a small proportion of the chalun population, um, in Afrikaans they call them the trackfish, the fish that move, about 5% of that population seem to be genetically pre-programmed to be movers. They, they're born with a gene that says you're not going to stay in the same place. Um, and because of this gene, through the tag and release project, we've been able to monitor the, the spillover, the fish that have been swimming out of the reserve and, and moving into the adjacent or restocking the adjacent fished areas, which is one of the real benefits of, of MPAs um, because they actually work like banks and they, they're able to protect the capital and then seed the adjacent areas, the fished areas, both through the movement of, of sub-adult and adult fish out of the reserves, as well as, as Colin mentioned, the seeding of, of eggs and larvae that drift in the, in, the, in the water column and then settle outside the MPAs. Some species we found such as the red steambrus in Tsitsikama and the Scotsman in Ponderland are very, very resident as juveniles. The small fish stay in the same place, um, small home range sizes, but once they reach ma maturity, um, they realize that uh, they've got to move. And so these both these species will migrate up the, up the coast, uh, the east coast of South Africa in a northward direction and spawning takes place in the northern parts of their distribution range, and the adults never return. So that's where the adults live, and the eggs and larvae are, are carried in, inside the Agalis current and settle in the southern parts of their distribution range. So these fish have evolved to use this um, current and the, the pattern to, to ensure their, their success as a species. Other species, as we know, are highly migratory. So Shad and El or Elf and Garrick and Leophis are highly migratory and generally spend very little time in MPAs um, because they, they're moving all the time. But as I think Ryan is going to tell us later, more recent evidence from acoustic telemetry suggests that many of them are actually returning home to a, a home ground on completion of spawning. And if that home ground is inside an MPA, that's going to give them a lot more protection. The last thing I want to talk about is the growth rate. So using tag recapture, when we tag the fish, we measure them. When we recapture them, we measure them. And if they've been at liberty for long times, we can work out the, the growth rate. And we've shown that many of our species are very, very slow growing, such as speckled snapper and the mussel cracker, both of which can live for more than 30, 30 years. So this highlights that, that these species are, are highly vulnerable to being fished out. So just in this little presentation, I hope that I've been able to inspire you to, to recognize the incredible value of our MPAs and to do your best to promote them and look after them. And happy MPA day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, for something completely different and a really nice insight into the research tagging work. Our next presenter is Dr. Anthony Bernard, and he's from the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity in Grahamstown. And over to you. 
Thanks, Judy. Um, thanks, Bruce and Colin. You know, some really interesting talks. Good to hear the, the full history of everything that you guys have been doing. I will share my screen. All right, yeah, so uh, my name is Anthony Bernard. I work at the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, which is based in Makanda, previously Gramstown. Um, and we are a unit of the National Research Foundation. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to try and give you a, a very quick crash course on underwater visual census and the different types of census, uh, underwater census, and how it's contributed to uh, the science of marine protected areas. Okay, so to start in the beginning, um, a marine protected area, uh, well, they types of spatial management whereby a portion of the ocean space, typically relating to the sea floor, is identified as important for a specific ecological reason. Uh, this reason could be um, that there are important or vulnerable habitat types, um, the areas are associated with high diversity of marine animals, or, or they are areas where fish aggregate um, and are vulnerable to overfishing. Identifying areas that are suitable for spatial management uh, requires data. Um, and this data can then contribute to, towards critical biodiversity maps, uh, like the one that you see here with all the dark green and lighter green areas, highlighting areas of different importance for different species. Um, this was developed, by, um, produced by Linda Harris and, and others um, for planning this marine spatial planning within South Africa. Uh, once, the, once the MPAs have been established, um, they are then managed with the aim to maintain or improve the ecological condition within the borders. Um, and to measure this research and monitoring of the important ecological features is required. Um, and it's in this space where the observation-based field re research operates. Um, importantly, uh, research and monitoring activities in marine protected areas must not be in conflict with the objectives of the MPA. And these are typically to protect habitat species and allow them to recover from unsustainable human activities. Uh, this means that as far as possible, the methods used to collect the data need to be non-destructive. Uh, historically, data were collected with nets or sleds dragged through the water column or over the sea floor, as well as hook and line fishing. But these all result in some or other form of direct impact to the animals that are being investigated, and in worst cases, habitat destruction for bottom trawling and dredging. As a research community, we are also becoming increasingly aware of our own impacts to fragile marine ecosystems and species. Uh, where in the past there have been a few alternatives um, to these invasive methods, there are now numerous options that are non-invasive and more effective in certain instances. Uh, this is where the observation-based methods where, all come into play, where observers or videos are used to record what is seen underwater, um, and, and these are the common examples. Uh, that being said, however, uh, the old school methods still definitely have their value, as Bruce and Colin have, have, have shown. Uh, Shore-based angling is, is definitely one of the main examples, um, and it's the most effective tool to sample shallow water fishes, especially in turbulent environments uh, where wave action and low visibility make observation-based met observation methods impractical. They also allow for tagging and, and collection of genetic material that enables population and, and movement studies. Um, and all of this greatly advances our understanding of, of the fish ecology and also of the MPAs, the role MPAs play. So within the marine environment, observations of life underwater require that the observer uh, is underwater or for a remote system to be underwater while being controlled from the surface or pre-programmed to carry out a specific task. Uh, the first quantitative underwater visual surveys of fish were carried out in, in the 50s in Hawaii using scuba-based surveys. And, and at a similar time, uh, underwater television uh, was being highlighted as a suitable method to observe marine animals and habitats over broad depth ranges. However, it wasn't until the mid to late 80s for scuba and mid to late 90s for video that these observation-based techniques started gaining widespread support and appearing more frequently in the scientific literature. Uh, you can see in the scatter plot on the, on the left um, how from mid 1990s there's an exponential rise in, in research being published using video-based methods. So the increase in uptake can be attributed to technological advances uh, that made uh, the equipment safer in terms of the diving, uh, cheaper and more accessible, but also methodological advances that improved the accuracy and precision of the data and the ability to reliably address research questions. 
Uh, interestingly, the rise of the underwater visual census methods coincided with the growth in policy support for marine polluted areas, which followed the 1962 World Parks Congress. And this growth has continued to the present day with targets for MPA coverage set to between 20 and 30%. Um, you can quite clearly see how this has exponentially grown. Also, again, from the mid 1990s, um, so this, this growth in the, in the need or the, the establishment of MPAs has fueled the need for research to firstly improve our understanding of the structure and functioning of marine ecosystems. And then secondly, to map the distributions of habitats and diversity uh, for spatial planning, and then understand the ecosystems and species responses following the MPA establishment. This all has contributed to the growth and advancement of underwater visual census and video survey techniques, which are now widely used around the world to support management and advance understanding of marine ecosystems. So there are now quite a few different observational methods and adaptations to these uh, to quantitatively survey fish underwater. The ones that are most widely used in uh, MPA research include scuba line transect surveys. This involves scuba divers swimming along a transect line of a set width and length and recording on a piece of paper the abundance and size of all the different species in the transect area. A relatively new adaptation of this, uh, of the line transit method is the diver operated video method, which is essentially the same thing as the scuba or the observer based uh, method and data, but rather data is recorded on the videos, um, uh, which allows for late uh, post processing of the, of the data to get, of the videos to get the data out. Uh, a relatively different method are your baited remote underwater video systems or baited remote underwater stereo video systems. Uh, these are commonly termed BRAVs. Um, here you have a camera in an underwater housing mounted to look over the seafloor with a bait container used to attract fish into the field of view. Uh, when used in stereo configuration, you get data on the diversity, abundance and size of fish at a site. Remotely operated vehicles. Uh, are another method that are used to carry out exploratory surveys or line transect surveys in a similar way to the diver operated camera systems. The advantages of the, of the ROVs um, is that they are much less restricted by depth. And then lastly, towed camera is another commonly used method uh, where the systems are towed behind a ship over the seafloor while cameras record uh, the habitats and animals during the transect. Uh, these are typically used on soft, soft bottom habitats. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Um, some of the strongest findings from uh, obs observation-based research to support MPA science um, and marine ecology come from global scale data sets, such as those provided by the Reef Life Survey and the Global Finprint Project. And um, these are two quite well-known examples. Uh, Reef Life Survey is a volunteer-based research program that uses scuba visual census method and relies on a global network of volunteers to collect data. In 2010, uh, they carried out a global survey which included two sites in South Africa's MPAs, so Titsikama and Table Mountain, inside and outside of these parks. And to date, the program has conducted 15,000 surveys in 53 countries around the world. Um, while there's no active collection of reef life survey data in South Africa at present, there are efforts to re-establish this monitoring program at key sites around the coastline. Uh, then in 2015, the Global Finprint project was initiated, uh, and this used baited remote underwater video systems, so the BROVs, to census the global coral reef shark assemblages. And here, um, Isimangalisa was included uh, within, within the project. Uh, this project resulted in 20,000 hours of video footage being collected from 400 reefs in 58 countries. So what has been learned? Um, this plot basically shows increasing lines show positive effects, and, and decreasing lines uh, show negative effects. Um, and, and all these monitoring programs have provided uh, direct evidence to improve our understanding of how MPA design and placement determines the recovery potential of fish and ecosystems. So the key messages are um, that ecological response is stronger in a no-take MPA than a partially protected MPA, as demonstrated in the first line. Um, enforcement capacity is essential. Uh, if you don't have people policing uh, the MPAs, then they're not likely to work. Uh, the larger MPAs work better than smaller ones, although this doesn't mean that small ones aren't effective. Uh, recovery takes time, uh, so you're not going to see immediate effects. And there's some evidence to suggest that you need between 35 and 60 years, depending on how badly depleted the reefs were at the start. 
Isolation from human populations results in a stronger ecological response. Um, and in, in addition to this, intense human activity around the MPA uh, reduces its ability to sustain fish biomass and the presence of top predators, even when enforcement is high. Um, and this just demonstrates how, how fish can move in and out of the MPAs. Um, observational data has also shown that sharks and rays, um, which are more wide roam roaming, also benefit from spatial management, such as shark sanctuaries um, and closed areas. Uh, you can see anything to the, the right of the gray line is a, is a positive effect, anything to the left of the gray line is a negative effect. Um, while well, areas where gill netting and drum lines are permitted have significantly fewer sharks. Uh, interestingly, staff size and, and capacity and budget capacity, more than any other criteria, are the strongest determinants of conservation impact, with adequately staffed MPAs reporting three times greater ecological effects than poorly staffed MPAs. Uh, these findings all feed valuable information back into the management systems to help improve the design of future MPAs um, to maximize the chance of positive ecological outcomes. Additionally, this research has clearly demonstrated the dire state of fish and shark populations outside of, outside of MPAs, um, with sharks and rays lost from many locations around the world, and the, and the majority of fish reefs missing over half the expected biomass with knock on effects to ecosystem functioning. Um, in terms of South Africa, uh, observation based research has been carried out in most of South Africa's coastal marine protected areas and a few of our offshore ones. Uh, the vast majority of this research um, has, been, has been carried out with video-based methods, including the BRAVs and stereo BRAVs and the remotely operated vehicles and then towed camera systems. Um, this research has broadly been in the form of ex exploration to support marine spatial planning. And the lines coming out of the block indicates the, the locations where, where it's been carried out. Um, there's been baseline surveys and long-term monitoring to support management in, in many of the MPAs, and then spatial comparisons to measure the ecological response and state of fish assemblages outside of the MPAs. And this has obvious links back to the management and spatial planning. Uh, ecological research within established MPAs has also been carried out. Uh, here, the ecosystems within an old MPA are assumed to to better reflect natural states, allowing researchers to gain a better understanding of natural ecosystem structure. Quantitative underwater visual census uh, research in South Africa started in the late 80s with Colin Buxton, as Colin indicated, uh, where it was shown that species such as Red Roman and Coppestiembras and Dacharat were more abundant and bigger in Titsikama MPA than fished areas near Port Elizabeth. Um, subsequent to this, a number of studies have shown positive conservation outcomes for various species and groups of fish and sharks in no-take MPAs, including the Dehuip, uh, Chokama, Roburg, Titsikama, Bird Island, Amatola, Ponderland, and Itsimangalisa parks. This is despite the constraints imposed by limited budgets and low capacity for broad-scale enforcement. Uh, observational data has also been widely used in marine spatial planning within South Africa and has fed into the design of the newly established Pakisa MPA network, as well as baseline ecological surveys have been conducted in 19 of our coastal marine protected areas to allow continued long term monitoring and continued support for management. Uh, to end off, um, I just like so this area of research has had great support within South Africa from the Department of Science and Innovation and the National Research Foundation, who have invested significantly in infrastructure through the shallow marine and coastal research infrastructure, the African coelacanth research program, um, and now recently the South African polar research infrastructure. Um, and this has enabled a lot of the work that has, that, that, that has been carried out within South Africa. Uh, but also there's been a great uptake um, within the management institutions. Uh, so the Department of Forestry, Fisheries, um, and agriculture, uh, and as well as the NGOs. Um, so there's, there's strong local capacity to advance this field of research within South Africa. Uh, and moving forward, we just need to work on our local coordination to make the most of our resources and, and, and make the most of the data that we have available. Uh, the scuba-based techniques are less frequently used, uh, in part because our sea conditions aren't very reliable, making scuba surveys impractical, uh, but, but also because of health and safety requirements for scuba surveys make them much more logistic, logistically complex um, than the remote camera methods. That being said, scuba has been successfully used at various locations around South Africa 
And this is an area of research that needs to be rejuvenated. Lastly, the ecological response is just one part of the puzzle. Um, the involvement and buy-in of all stakeholders in the spatial management uh, process is essential, especially when agreed upon trade-offs result in NPAs being zoned in ways which negatively affect the ecosystem states. Uh, South Africa obviously needs to prioritize capacity to, capacity to enforce the MPAs, um, but responsible stewardship and collective action should be encouraged among the user groups to ensure that the MPAs achieve their, their social and ecological goals. And that's me done. Thanks. Thank you very much, and for something again completely different and from really, really innovative and interesting research. Thank you. Our final speaker for tonight's webinar is Dr. Ryan Daly. He is also from the Oceanographic Research Institute, part of Sambra in Durban. So, Ryan, over to you. Thanks so much, Judy, um, and good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Judy and team, for organizing everything. Um, let me just get my video share working here and we'll be on track shortly. Um, as we're waiting for this, I know that there are lots of questions that are coming through in the chat and Colin is handling most of those questions because I think we're unlikely to have uh, question time at the end of the webinar. We are running quite, quite a bit over time. Um, so I think the questions are coming through and Colin's handling them. So as that, that happens, you won't have time for questions at the end. Um, I'm just trying to think. There we go. Thanks, Graham. Um, Graham, I'll just coordinate with you to go to the next slide when I'm ready for it, if that's all right. That's fine. Okay, can you go back to the start and then we'll get going. Um, sorry for that, guys. I know technical issues are uh, always a challenge and by now we should have figured out how to use Zoom. But anyways, here we are still. Um, but yeah, good evening to everybody and, and thanks for joining us. Um, I guess, yeah, but I guess so much has been covered already by um, by Ant and Bruce and, and Colin. So I'm going to basically just show you some pretty pictures and tell you a little bit of a story about uh, some of the research that, that I've been involved in over the last 10 years um, involving marine protected areas um, and, and top predators. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge all the collaborators and all the people we've worked with over all these years that have made all of this possible too. Let's go to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> I guess... One of the questions um, is, do marine protected areas benefit mobile top predators? Um, as if we equate this to the terrestrial environment, we know um, big top predators need to eat a lot. They typically need a lot of habitats. Um, same goes for the ocean. Species such as sharks um, can be very mobile and cover big distances. So can marine protected areas be beneficial for them? Right, next slide, please. So, one of the species that I've, I've been studying for, for about 10 years now or so is the Zambezi shark, um, also known as the bull shark. Um, it's sort of an iconic South African species, um, well known um, and, and relatively common on, on our east coast of South Africa. But we really know little about its movements and how it uses marine protected areas, if marine protected areas could even be beneficial for the species. So we said about trying to find out a little bit about what the shark does, and where it goes, and if it uses MPAs at all. Next slide, please. So if you can just push play on the video there, you'll see in the screen in PowerPoint, there we go. So uh, how mobile are these Zambezi sharks? So these are tracks of four Zambezi sharks that we tagged in the Breda River that essentially moved um, all the way up the coast, uh, pretty much to Northern Mozambique. And so, to answer the question, they're very mobile. They can traverse almost the entire south and east coasts of South Africa. And so this really does, I guess, emphasize the need to answer the question, can protected areas be remotely beneficial to these, these sharks as they traverse almost the entire east coast? And um, you can just go to the next slide. So <clears throat> as you can imagine, um, looking at this map of South Africa's extremely diverse um, MPAs, uh, those sharks are traversing through about 17 different marine protected areas as they move up and up the coast and then back down again every year. So these sharks are, are, are crossing an immense uh, 
seascape of, of biodiversity from the temperate south coast to the tropical east coast. And then they're going outside of South Africa. So really, I guess one needs to ask, you know, are MPAs for these sharks? And go to the next question and next slide. So if we zoom out a little bit to the, the MPA sort of seascape uh, in South Africa, um, our neighboring country has a couple of MPAs too. Up on the top right corner is the Bazaruta National Park, and in the south, south of Mozambique is the Ponta de Oro Pasha Marine Reserve, which has recently changed its name to the Maputo National Park. Two um, large um, MPAs, and, and we share a border with, with the Ponta de Oro Pasha Marine Reserve, um, as it is right next door to the Ismagulisa Marine Protected Area. So um, if you think back to the shark track, that shark goes through all of our South African MPAs, as well as all of those Mozambican MPAs listed there. And where I've got those gold stars are just sites that we've tagged these sharks and, and monitored where they've gone. Next slide, please. So if you zoom into the Ponto de Oro Parsh Marine Reserve, just across our border to the north of us, uh, we, we started tagging these Zambezi sharks um, 10 years ago with acoustic tags and, and have this year now been tracking them for 10 years. So it's a tag that um, transmits a coded signal picked up by those underwater receivers that um, are focused at specific sites and then also distributed throughout South Africa and Mozambique. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we also have different ways of trying to understand what these sharks do. Uh, we've got to get really creative because these sharks hold their secrets uh, close to themselves. And so we use satellite tags, acoustic tags, um, and this is an example of a camera tag that deployed on an adult uh, Zambezi shark, just to try to find out more about what they do, especially when they're in marine protected areas. Go to the next slide. So this is a somewhat confusing graph. I'm gonna try and talk through it quickly. Um, so the blue lines just represent periods of residency of one shark within a year. And if you just click forward there, forward one. Um, this shows the, arrival and departure within the Ponte d'Oro MPA. So this shark um, you'll see arrived on the 3rd of November in year two, and then uh, left on the 24th of June in year three, and was completely absent up until the 31st of October. And that blue line just represents the fact that it was within one small site um, detected by one receiver. So a special scale of within 500 meters, the shark was in this protected area every single day for 180 days straight from the 31st of October to the 31st of May, when it then departed, no detections, um, and then arrived again on the 31st of October in year four. So really this represents periods of, of site fidelity, meaning that they're in the same place every single day for up to 180 days. And then they have a period, period of absence. So think back to that uh, video of the shark moving up and down the coast, but then it returns again to, to exactly the same place at almost exactly the same time of year, year after year. And if we look at those 10 year tags, a lot of the sharks are doing the same thing every single year. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so one of the questions is, well, what drives them to get to these specific places at these certain times of, of year? So to try to figure this out, um, we, well, first we scratched the heads a lot and then we, we started to look at what they were associated with at the study site. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, if you just push play on the video, please. Um, these are the results of one of the camera tags attached to the fin of the Zambezi shark, just giving you the POV of the Zambezi shark. So it's swimming along, uh, comes across his mate, uh, another Zambezi shark. And, and we, we saw quite a lot of this sort of um, associative behavior between sharks at the study sites. And this, gives us a visual representation of that through this fin cam. But if we look at the detection data, we see a lot of these sharks arrive at the same place at the same time uh, every single year. So the question was, I guess, do these sharks just follow each other to this protected area or are they doing something more? Go to the next slide. So what about their prey? Um, at, the, at the study sites, we, we have aggregations of this giant trevelli, uh, which is, or giant kingfish, as it's known in South Africa. Um, and, and these sharks appear to, to be associated with these giant trevelli. Uh, 
if you go to the next slide. Uh, so we, back in 2015, described sort of the largest aggregation of giant trevelli uh, in the world. There's thousands of fish that, that get together every single year um, at the study sites. And that just shows you how massive this um, event is. Go to the next slide. So when we tagged the, the giant trevelli, we found that they had very specific timing in terms of their arrival and departure from the, the specific sites within the marine protected area every single year. So essentially, we found that they were lunatics responding to the lunar phase. Um, basically, they'd arrive at the start of the full moon and depart at the end of the full moon uh, every single summer moon. Um, and if you think about these fish, they, they need to get together to spawn. So they all need to be sure that they're in the same place at the same time every year to, to successfully spawn. And, and this started to really give us a clue as to why the Zambezi sharks would show up at the same place at the same time every year. Um, it's not that they had watches, but, but they were following prey that pretty much did have watches by using the season and, and the moon phase and, and explain some of why these sharks are so specific with their place and time every year within this MPA. Go to the next slide, please. So where do these fish go when they're not in this marine protected area? Um, we saw that pretty much all the fish that we tagged were in fact South African fish. So they were crossing the border back down to South Africa where they'd remain for a period over the winter season and then come back up the coast um, every summer to aggregate to spawn in the Ponte de Oro partial marine reserve. And these sharks would then follow them to these places over those periods. So both fish and sharks Yes, are highly mobile, but both have periods of residency for some of the shark. Well, these sharks can stay in the same place for um, 180 days or more every single year in between migrations. But what's really interesting too about these giant trevelli is that they're in fact linking marine protected areas. So these giant trevelli um, specifically had periods of residency in the Ponta MPA, but then also down in the Ponderland MPA. Go to the next slide. So essentially, these fish were linking Pondo to Ponta, um, which is incredible considering first how special each of these places are, but that these marine protected areas, both in different countries, both vastly different in terms of habitats, um, are home to the same fish for, for some extended periods uh, every year. And between these marine protected areas, um, when they do migrate, they seem to be having these very directed movements between places. Um, so just, yeah, an incredible link between MPAs and countries. Go to the next slide, thanks. So how do MPAs help these mobile top predators, both the sharks and the fish? Let me just click forward. Just click forward once. So um, they can protect spatially predictable events. Um, so like we saw every year at the same place at the same time, the sharks and these fish would show up um, for periods of time spanning months at a time. So spatially protecting these areas makes sense. Um, they protect key areas, uh, key events such as spawning. So these fish spawn in exactly the same place every single year, which is a really critical uh, event for the species on our coast. And considering that pretty much all of the South African stock of the species occurs in the country next door, having that spawning event in neighboring MPA really benefits um, the entire population in South Africa. It also promotes transboundary conservation. So I understanding that we can't put a fence around these animals, but we also can't put a fence at the border, even though it is between countries. There's no border patrol in the ocean. And, and a lot of our research has highlighted how almost all our mobile top predatory sharks across the border into Mozambique can come back. So it's important that we not only have MPAs in South Africa for South African species, but that we collaborate with Mozambique to ensure that key areas are protected there too. Uh, we also saw how these, these mobile top predators can link uh, key habitats between uh, countries and also MPAs can act as refuges for them as they swim up and down the coast. Um, and we also saw, finally, how a protected area can benefit multiple species. So when protection is, is in a certain place, it can benefit not only one, but there can be a knock-on impact. So we saw that the sharks were there for the giant trevelli, 
that were then spawning. But by, by having an MPA there, it protects the entire ecosystem. So just examples of how MPAs do benefit these mobile um, sharks and rays. It's not a panacea. It's not going to fix everything because they do come across very uh, broad diversity of risks as they migrate between these areas, but it certainly can help. Thanks. Next slide. Yeah, thanks so much, guys, and appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, again, a slightly different view to the effectiveness of MPAs. I'd like to just close with a, a very big thank you to all of you. I know that there have been lots and lots of questions, and a very big thank you, Colin. I can see that you've been incredibly busy in the question and answer section, and you've been answering questions like mad, and I think that, uh, and you've also been answering questions, so I think that we've covered just about all of the, the questions. Um, the last question here is, um, where are the social scientists? That's a really good question. And I think that for next year's MPA day, we will have a session just like this, where we will talk to the social scientists. The question that we were answering today was, are marine protected areas effective from a biological perspective? And I think that we've pretty much got an answer from all of our scientists today on that one. And I think that next year, brilliant idea. Let's focus on the social science and look at MPAs from a different perspective, because MPAs really are a part of the marine conservation toolkit, but they're not the only tool in the toolkit. There are many other ways that we need to look at if we're going to ensure that our marine environment is protected for future generations, because that's ultimately what we're looking at. It's not just about us, it's about the future generations. So a very, very big thank you to Flo for hosting us tonight. Thank you, all of you. We have had up to 152 people with us. So thank you very much to all of you who have spent just over an hour with us learning more about marine protected areas. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Colin, very, very much for sharing your time with us, for doing these presentations, and for sharing your knowledge and your passion for marine protected areas and for fish with us all. Thank you very much, everybody. This is the end of our webinar and a very happy Marine Protected Area Day 2022. Bye.